And uh, welcome to part two of our first annual uh, teaching and Learning Presidential Forum uh, Symposium on Flexible Learning. So for those of you who joined us in the morning and are joining us in the afternoon, thank you for um, being stalwart and being able to fit in the second half into your busy schedules. And cognizant of that, I think I'm going to give a little bit of a recap of my introductory remarks this morning, uh, try to capture the essence of things, but also not um, re reiterate word for word what I had to say. Uh, Essentially, I started the morning by thanking Jack Lightstone and recalled to him uh, the not many months ago when he said to me, Anna, I would really like an opportunity to sit down with Brock instructional faculty and staff to talk about online learning, e-learning, hybrid learning, and all manner of flexible learning that we've laterly engaged at at Brock University. And I said, this sounds like a wonderful idea. And I chatted with my colleague, Jill Gross, who's the director of CPI, as you all know. And uh, we thought, yes, indeed, there's wisdom to do this because it's in important and powerful forum uh, to share practices, to learn from one another, and quite frankly, to build synergies around this issue. So we thought flexible was a good term to capture, and I was interested to see this morning that we, flexible, the term flexible came up quite a bit in context of both teaching and from the learner's perspective as well. And flexibility, as you know, builds, it's, it's adaptive and it builds capacity and resilience. And, and that's what I hope for us to do today, is to build that resilience and capacity as we look over the landscape of the 21st century learner. And the other thing I did was, was foreground a little bit of the context where we are right now in this particular moment in time, which I believe is quite critical. Uh, and three things have unfolded in a fairly you know, quick space of time. The first has been the recent agreement that Brock has signed with the government around our strategic mandate agreement and as you know and I've heard you I've heard you know you've heard SMA quite a bit that there are three pillars and the first pillar is putting students first and under that pillar, there's a whole array of initiatives, service learning being one of them, experiential learning in its vast expanse from work integrated learning through to service learning, online learning, e-learning, hybrid learning, flexible delivery systems, so that we're not only looking at the how we teach um, and why we teach. So the SMA sort of has crystallized our, our step ahead, and it's also identified key performance indicators that we're going to be measuring our success against. And one of the critical pieces for us this afternoon afternoon is building capacity around service learning. So I first want to thank you for coming out and engaging in four wonderful speakers who will share their best practices with us. And then, like we did this morning, we'll sort of spring springboard into how we can translate into doing it differently or better in our own class venue, but also building capacity across the institution. So the SMA was number one. But what I reminded the group about this morning is the SMA simply crystallized what we've been doing over the last number of years. And those of you, many in the room who have received successful grants in service learning know that through our service learning resource center, we have done a lot. And I look to Gail Cook, who's our associate faculty member, and of course Sandy Howe on my left, who's going to be orchestrating this afternoon. Uh, many of you visited that center and had support there. So we've been doing great work over the last three years or so around that. We also have done wonderful work around developing our own in-house strategies for support through CPI for online and, and hybrid learning, and also building our spring summer. Um, and that truly is another example of a flexible delivery modality and or time space continuum to think about doing some really interesting things um, in the spring summer forum. And one thing comes to mind too is our accelerated courses, offering students the opportunity for a course in a condensed period of time. So our SMA is one. Building on historic strengths that we've already done. And remember, the SMA isn't the government coming in and saying, thou shalt do. It's us saying, we have put Brock students first. This has been a foundational principle since 1964. This is how we've done it in the past. And now we have more tools to build that capacity and retune and refine that bedrock, because that's our foundation. And then the third piece, which is really important and critical, and Sandy will talk a little bit about it, I talked a little bit about this morning, is that we now have an array of some grant possibilities from the government. The government is going to be calling another second round of MTCU grants for online hybrid development. So that, that incentive envelope is going to be there, and I'm trying to sort of strategize around getting that word out through associate deans and department chairs and department members. The reason I mention it now is because that initiative is going to ask faculty to think both cross institution and from institution to institution. So that if you have some creative ideas 
and in this case, my one discussion point here is for online e-learning, is that, that I will ask you to sort of think outside the Brock network and network potentially with other like-minded scholars within your various disciplines. Now for the service learning component, Sandy's going to talk a little bit later about the envelope of funding that we in-house are going to bolster and support around service learning, not only for new initiatives, but for ongoing initiatives. And again, I won't comment too much around that as, as she will articulate that a little better than I will. So this is part two of a, of a I think so far has been a ex very ex successful day. Um, we had outstanding speakers this morning. We have another equally round of outstanding speakers this afternoon. and. I do. I will add one footnote, and I'm absolutely convinced of it, that over the last mem few years of our historical memory at this institution, I don't think there has ever been a sector in higher education that has gone such radical revolution, not only at Brock, but across the sector. And that's going to continue. And I think the one area that clearly where, where we experience exponentially more potential change than elsewhere, and my research colleagues, Dr. Libin, can probably challenge me if you'd like to, there, is teaching and learning, um, or learning and teaching. So it's, it's this area that technology has gone, risen exponentially. It's this area um, that we see current initiatives, both at the institution and across the sector. Um, it, it's, of course, within an envelope of uh, the changing demographic of our students, heightened expectations of accountability from the government, heightened expectations and, and our own self-determination around what we value and how we intend to build Brock's capacity. So all of these forces, I think, have sort of focused now in this particular moment in time, which I think means that it's really appropriate to have a full day set apart to reflect on teaching. So I look forward to the afternoon. I was delighted by the morning. I have no doubt we'll continue that energy and synergy into the afternoon. And it's so critical. And here, I guess, I'm going to say in particular, service learning actually links two of the pillars. It links the first pillar that says we put our students first. But it links that first pillar with a third pillar around community engagement. And that's the key. And that's why um, Sandy and other members of CPI have, have orchestrated today so that we're going to hear from the various facets that are so important around service learning. The other thing I'll add is that, I, quite frankly, I think Brock is a bit ahead of the curve on this. I think we've done outstanding work. We have to do more to institutionally support service learning. But we've made great strides, certainly since I been purview to the growth around naming it, identifying it, and now we're hoping to build capacity and track it. So we know what service learning is. It needs to be very narrowly defined. We want to continue to build capacity, and it is something that as an institution we are committed to do. It is in stone. It is part of how we feel we are to be held accountable to ourselves, to our community, to the government. Very important this afternoon, so thank you for coming. I realize it's always a sacrifice as I look around the room and see many people who carry a number of levels of administrative responsibility, so I do appreciate it. And um, what I hope to get out of today is for those of you who have experience, to share those stories, and for those of you who are perhaps new to the forum, to listen, to be open-minded, to be willing to engage, and to imagine what it would be like if you actually took on this path as part of your course or barrier of courses that you teach. So once again, thank you for coming. And I'm going to say one, another thank you to CPI and the Center for Service Learning, who have done an outstanding job orchestrating today. So Sandy, over to you.